Yo! What happens when you make one of the largest music platforms to ever exist change music forever only to Thanos snap it away in about a year? Then you'd be named Apple Incorporated and come out with a little program called iTunes. Maybe you heard of it. From its history, its eventual downfall, and features they definitely want you to forget about, I won't let them. We're looking at this empire thick and thin and see why it crumbled. And if at any point you end up enjoying this video, then consider subscribing. It would mean a ton. Because of you, we just hit 200,000. And to celebrate, I'm going to be doing a live stream, my first ever live stream, right here on YouTube, where you guys can ask me questions about me, the videos, music stuff, whatever. If you're watching this after it happened, hey, how you doing? Truly, thank you so much. Anyways, let's get into this. Enjoy! Hey there, what's happening? You know, you actually caught me at a bad time. I'm currently helping this guy right here. Wait, you think I just sit at the desk all day doing nothing? The nerve of these guys, can you believe them? I got a business to run, I do business here. In fact, why don't you tell these good people what it is you're looking for today? Uh, okay. Do you have anything from Nine Inch? All no. right, nobody cares. Phew, all this customer service is tiring. I bet Apple doesn't have to do this much work. Their customer service is 30 pre-recorded lines, all a different way of saying, turn it off and on again. But they weren't always that big. A pod here, a computer there, and a killer app under it all. So how do they actually do it? Uh, are you, are you asking me? The year is 1999 and the internet just hit puberty, pimples and all. In this stage, lots of fun and equally sketchy websites and programs were popping up. Company pages, image and message boards, and places to get multiple, and I mean multiple, viruses. When it came to playing music on your computer, nobody was really giving it a lot of focus back then. There were some companies like Microsoft or Real Networks, but look at these things, they look like they came out of a swamp. Companies would also lock features behind their programs, like uh, the ability to crossfade? Just a bad time to be a digital music fan. But around this time, a file sharing app just hit the market called Napster and would allow peeps to share files between each other straight from their own computers. All this music for free? Wow, how generous of these labels to do that for us stinky consumers. Also, I'm lying. This thing almost nuked music. Man, a technologic thing that has the potential to cripple the music industry. How does this keep happening? Letting people listen and download virtually unlimited music right from their own home. No need to wait in line or spend $12 for a CD. Sure, it was illegal, but it was just so convenient. People flooding the service like Burger King after the Whopper commercial and the music labels and artists were not having it. Eventually, the music industry came together and shut it down three years later. But by that point, the damage was done. People were used to the ease of the service. And when that ended, new alternatives came crawling out of the sewer. But through it all, the founders of Napster held high and aren't dumb. They saw a gap in a market, telling interviewers at the time that all people really want is the ease of getting this stuff legitimately. People will pay if it's convenient for them, because if they don't provide, guys like them will. Fast forward now and wow, Spotify earned how much last year? And just like our friends at Napster, a little fruit company also saw a gap in a market. As with the music industry in shambles and the huge success of a certain mp3 player, they sought it upon themselves to fill this problem the Steve way. <laughs> No, not, not him. Starting off as SoundJam MP, this would be the foundation for what would eventually become iTunes, as Apple would buy this company and hire the devs to work on their software. I never used this thing, but Mac Addict says it was freaking awesome. Thank you, Mac Attic. The way Apple saw it, a new way to access and enjoy music was necessary, as being in the midst of developing their own portable MP3 players, they wanted to create something that would both compete with and maybe change the music industry, hopefully for the better, and for the moolah. Introducing iTunes. This looks like a calculator. The OG digital jukebox. This was Apple's real stepping stone into digital music. They built on top of Sound Jam, adding features like burning CDs and different language support on top of these early 2000s effects. This is what the future looks like, guys. I'm warning you now. Later coupled with the newly released iPod and the two helped carry the wave for music listening. iTunes not only helped change the way we listen to music, but also how we perceive media in a way. From albums to movies, this thing had its hand in helping 
helping shift the masses into a digital future. It was a good music manager that doubled as a music store. That wasn't heard of at the time, as normally you'd have these two things separated, but having it do both gave it a huge boost in popularity. I can buy or burn any song and have it instantly on my iPod? How convenient. But it wasn't all peaches and cream. There were tons of hurdles, annoying features, even a time when the whole thing almost collapsed on itself. But I'm getting ahead of myself. iTunes had 12 versions, each with their own improvements. The first two introduced the program to the world and added a CD burning feature, just like everyone else. Version 3 added audiobook support and the ability to rate your music. But iTunes 4 is when things really started schmoovin', as this version was the introduction of the iTunes Store. Being able to buy songs instantly from the store and have it appear in your library was crazy. This was also the first version to be available on Windows machines so you Billathan Gates boys can finally eat some fruit. I can see Mr. Scruff on my computer again. Every version up till then was Mac only. Part of the reason iTunes was so big was because this was the giga hub that let you do everything. Want to transfer files, update your pod, back stuff up, even on Windows? Oops, all iTunes. It was almost necessary in that sense. With iTunes 5, they added podcasts, no impulsive or Joe Rogan yet, as well as a feature called AirTunes, which later became AirPlay. And the next two versions saw the first real interface change. Things are looking cleaner, things are more bubbly, and would add music videos, TV shows, even movies that you could view on your computer and later your phone. What a showing. But although all this was good, Apple still needed the reason for people to come on over. Don't even look at a CD. And Apple, being the small company they were, found that reason in artist exclusives. Artists everywhere making deals with the big fruit, exclusively putting their music on there, usually through bonus tracks. Between 2007 and 2015, it seemed like every album had a bonus or two that you could find only on here. Sometimes they'd even be whole albums, like Coldplay's Viva La Vida or Ellie Goulding being exclusive to iTunes for a time. Channel Orange was released a week earlier on iTunes. Kanye's Love Lockdown sold 1.3 million on iTunes alone and even he's a pirate? From the pirate gang? All right then. But the other thing Apple cooked up would come as the iTunes Live program. Apple getting exclusive rights to old, sometimes new concerts or live innings and package them, throwing them on the service. And this would morph into iTunes sessions where newer acts would record live stuff and sell them as EPs. Across both, there's some notable acts here. This list is huge. They also added the cover flow feature to iTunes. Remember that? You'd rotate your device 90 degrees and a little PowerPoint presentation of your albums would show. I really like this. I thought it was fun. Now it sounds like things are going pretty smoothly. By this point, the iPod had completely taken over MP3 players. Either you have one or you know someone that does. The Mac attack was growing and iTunes was one of the largest music stores online. And with the very first iPhone recently launched, there's no way this thing can go left, right? Well, you're right. They took a double left, because now we enter into what I like to refer to as the iTunes Dark Age, where since they were so big, things got way out of hand. It started with iTunes 8 and the introduction of Genius Playlists, Apple generating a playlist for you based off one song. It worked kind of like Spotify's radio feature. It also had this window on the side where Apple would recommend songs to you that weren't in your library. You couldn't get around without lugging this bowl. But sometimes it felt like a way to just shove ads of albums in your face. This is also when lots of bugs started crawling in. Like there was one where if you connected your phone or pod, your computer would just crash. <sighs> Vista gang stay losing. Next was iTunes 9, small UI change. They added a home sharing feature, let you share music with other people in your home. They still kind of do this with their free family sharing feature. Netflix, take notes, man. And Spotify kind of has it with their family premium thing, but you have to pay for that. Netflix. Don't watch that. But all this is nothing compared to the next version, iTunes 10, with one of the worst features Apple has ever put in a program. And no, it's not the logo switching from the CD to the blob thing, which apparently people really hated at the time. This Wired article even has a link to an old tweet from this parody account defending the logo, and this tweet is over 10 years old. Back when Twitter looked like this, I don't know what's uglier. Oh, I know. And that's the introduction of ping. What the fuck is ping? Thank you for asking. Here, get in the coffin. This was Apple's attempt at a social media thing. With Facebook booming and MySpace snoozing, Apple started choosing to enter the ring. This was clearly a Facebook wannabe and they didn't even hide it well. You'd get stuff like a profile picture, an about me tab, and a feeds tab, where friends could see what you were up to, your reviews on stuff, concerts you were going to, you know, everything Facebook could already do. It was clunky, confusing to use, and was missing features that other sites had. Got no friends on Facebook? Good luck here. 
people hated this thing, and it didn't help that it was shoved in your face every time you opened the app. What was the end goal with this? Did they really expect people to make the Great Migration? Yeah, dude, I'm definitely seeing Lady Gaga at the HP Pavilion in San Jose, California, sponsored by Dell Computers. How did you know? Yeah, this totally was a failure. Like, asking people to download an external app when the alternative was a website away? You're not winning this, buddy. But now we're finally snapping back to reality with the next update, iTunes 11, which got a brand spanking new UI, iCloud was fully in, and they realized how amazing Ping was that when it tried to get into the launch party, it was executed on the spot. This added a new store, an up next feature, a sleek mini player, better search, it was a huge step in the right direction. And finishing it off is iTunes 12, the final version of the program released in 2014, adding family sharing and a bunch of other stuff. It still gets updates today, mainly just bug fixes. It did add this one feature that merges your music library with the music store. Who asked for this? And the next year, after reworking Beats Music, they finally unveiled their own streaming service. Apple Music in 2015, which is now the new spoiled younger brother. It's even got gifts and shit. Now for as great as this thing was, by the end of it, Apple was seeing the finish line. People were growing tired of iTunes. So what happened? If it was such a powerhouse, why did it kick the digital bucket? Things like iTunes Match and the ping fiasco left a sour taste in users' mouths. And although some of the features were nice, the new array of features every update made the service a lot more bloated than it needed to be. And the updates, oh god, the updates. Very minuscule changes that were almost forced on you via pop-ups. You like opening the app and getting hit with an update every single time? <laughs> I sure do. Whether you got it or you ticked the don't show me this shit box, it didn't even matter. Every time you open the app, you were the 100th visitor. But in the grand scheme of things, these were nothing compared to the two bigger reasons. The first problem started all the way back in 2004 as music sales generally were declining across the industry. Programs like LimeWire and hosting websites were still in blunt rotation and that never really went away. But the true nail in the coffin came in 2008 when music streaming started emerging. Sites like Deezer, Pandora, YouTube, and soon to be Spotify were laying the foundation for the future of music, hoping to fix the piracy problem their own way. And by 2009, actual music sales everywhere hit an all-time low as people were moving over to streaming. Yeah, you'd get ads, but it was free. Or pay a subscription and listen to whatever, whenever I want? Asterix? It's just so convenient. Seeing a trend? They first tried to compete with this thing called iTunes Radio, which were auto-generated radio stations based on artists. It was totally free, but it was really confusing to use, only available in the US and Australia, and the service was shut down three years later for the real competitor, Apple Music. So is there any use for iTunes today? Well, it depends. If you're on Windows or older Apple computers, you still need it to transfer over files and stuff onto your device. As for the digital jukebox itself, it is a way to manage your music and videos if you want, but it gets kind of annoying with the constant feature shoved in your face, especially because now, if you're on Windows, there are other programs out that I feel are much better, such as Music Bee, which does everything iTunes did in its prime, music, videos, books, but has way more quality of life features on top of being super customizable with how you want to present your stuff. or just forgo all of that and get Napster. But although it's gonzo, I can still look back and appreciate everything this little program did for me. In fact, because of their contributions to the music industry, in 2002, Apple won the Technical Grammy Award, a silver Grammy given out to people or companies who've done innovative things for music over on the physical side. When was this a thing? I didn't even know this was a thing. Which, all things considered, is a pretty fucking cool award to get. Thank you, iTunes. Still haven't forgiven the Grammys for that weekend snub. I will, I will never. Well, buddy, you're in luck. Turns out we did have nine inch nails. Here you go. Oh, I've been, I've been standing here for 12 minutes. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, here's one I did on crazy album rollout. It's like my favorite vid so far. Or if you want something a little shorter, check out my video on headphones and earbuds. I hear they're certified bangers. Just like that guy banging on the door. I'm not, I'm not getting it. I know